Welcome to the 2015 NCAA Men's Lacrosse Rules and Officiating video. This video was created to prepare and educate the NCAA lacrosse community for the 2015 season. Please note that this video is intended to be educational and the use of video footage in no way is intended to embarrass any team or official. The committee made three significant changes with respect to the face-off procedure. A new mechanic process was approved. There are several new rules and definitions with respect to picking up and or carrying the ball in the back of the stick. And there are several new definitions with respect to parts of the body coming into contact with either cross during a face-off. Damn. Procedures for conducting the actual face-off sure, are guys. as follows. The official conducting the face-off will hold the ball in his hand and will not place it on the ground as was previously done. The official shall indicate to the players the spot on which the face-off will take place and instruct the players to prepare for the face-off by saying down. All right, gentlemen, here's your spot right where my foot is. Down. Once the players are down, they are to move into their face-off position as quickly as possible. Players may kneel or stand as they get into position for the face-off. If the players are not positioned properly, the officials may adjust the player's positioning, including crosses, to ensure the face-off will be conducted fairly for both players. Note, all rules for positioning of players and sticks are in full effect and the same as in previous years. For example, nothing on the midline, nothing touching the plastic, sticks straight up and down, no leaning, etc. If face-off players are continually delaying this process, officials may call a violation for delay of game. Slide that head down a little bit. Okay. Once the players are in the proper position, the officials shall place the ball on the ground in between the head of each cross paying close attention to placing the ball in the middle of the head of each cross. Once the official is satisfied with the placement of the ball and of the positioning of the player's crosses, he shall instruct the players to remain motionless by saying, set. Officials will still have their hand on the ball and or crosses when the command set is given. After the set command, the official shall back out and blow the whistle when he is clear of the scrimmage area. The official does not have to be stationary and in all likelihood will still be moving backward when he blows the whistle to start play. Don't move. Set. The whistle cadence will vary with every face-off. Note, players will be in the face-off position longer than in previous years and they must wait for the sounding of the whistle. Violations, if they occur, are to be called by both face-off officials and recorded as previously done. Three or more violations on a team in one half will continue to result in a time-served technical foul on the violating team. White pennant, go ball! The committee approved a rule change that makes it illegal for a player to pick up the ball and carry it in the back of the stick. This new rule is not intended to change the way players approach the face-off. A few notes and comments will help clarify this new rule. It's important to note that a face-off player may still clamp or pinch the ball in the reverse side of his cross. The difference with this rule is that he must move, rake, or direct the ball immediately after gaining control of the ball. When approving this rule, the committee defined immediately as within one step. If a player gains possession on a faceoff in the reverse side of his cross and fails to move, rake, or direct it to a teammate or himself and takes more than one step, a faceoff violation has occurred. This will count as one of the three violations per half. If the ball squirts out and away from the face-off players on a face-off, no player may pick up the ball by jamming the reverse side of the cross on top of the ball. All ground balls are to be picked up by scooping the ball with the front of the cross. 
In each of these plays, the face-off man pinches the ball in the back of the stick and carries the ball. This is a face-off violation, and the ball shall be awarded to the opponent. Here, a loose ball is created off the face-off. The player in red traps the ball in the back of the stick and carries the ball. This is a violation, but since it came on a loose ball and not as part of the face-off battle, this is not counted as a face-off violation. Here are two examples of players pinching the ball in the back of the stick and immediately moving or raking the ball. These are legal plays. On a face-off, neither player may initiate contact with any body part to the crosses. This rule clarifies the previous wording that stated on the crosses. For example, if the elbow goes to the ground and then comes into contact with the cross of either player, a violation has occurred. This counts as one of the three violations per half. This new rule was added to decrease the length of time the face-off players will be down scrumming for the ball. The committee's intent is to get the ball out quickly to create a ground ball. These examples show illegal contact with the opponent's body or cross. The committee discussed all options extensively during its meetings and reviewed many concepts for the stalling procedures. Ultimately, the committee believes the past two seasons of play, with the new set of rules, have had the intended impact on the pace of play. Faster restarts, eliminating the horn on substitutions, and education with the stalling call have all led to a faster, more exciting brand of lacrosse. First, fundamentally, the stall warning remains the same, except what it is called. Shot clock replaces the old wording of timer on. As in the past, when a team is called for a stall warning, a valid shot must be taken within 30 seconds. The shot clock will be a 30 second visible clock and will stop and start in sync with the game clock. Two visible clocks are recommended and if available, may be used immediately. Visible shot clocks become mandatory for Division I play with the 2016 season and the 2017 season for Divisions II and III. This is a very good example of officials effectively using a stall warning. The officials provide an adequate amount of time for the team in black to substitute and start its offense. Clearly, the offensive team is not making an effort to create an offensive opportunity, and the officials correctly recognize this as stalling. In this staged footage of the administration of a stall warning, the officials communicate with each other to confirm a warning is close while allowing players to continue. The verbal communication between the crew is critical to effectively managing this aspect of the game. Peter? Yeah, I think we're ready to go almost. We'll see what okay. happens here. I'm on you, Tommy. Coming up. Coming up. Shot clock! Shot clock! Oh. 
The new rule states that after a team has satisfied the 30-second clearing clock and that team causes the ball to go back into the defensive half of the field, last to possess and last to touch, the result will be an immediate whistle and a quick restart for the offended team or a possible play on. To be clear, this new over and back rule will be called the same way every time, regardless whether or not the teams are playing at even strength or man up. This example shows an errant pass by the offensive team that crosses the midline. This is an immediate whistle and a quick restart because the team in white does not have clear possession. This illustration shows a situation where there could be a play on. Officials are instructed to allow these clear opportunities when presented. Play on! Here is an example of a legal play by an offensive team player who is across the midline. Batting the ball from the defensive half is legal, provided the ball remains in the attacking half, as it does here. Good! This play shows the offensive team legally batting the ball to a teammate in the offensive half. Good. However, he is pressured and steps across the midline. Procedure. This results in a turnover and a quick restart, providing the non-offending team an advantage opportunity. The new timeout rule allows for only the team in possession or entitled to possession to call a timeout during a dead ball situation when the stoppage of play is within the field of play. Examples of this are face-off violations, crease violations, over and back, warding off, loose ball pushes, moving picks, etc. This ensures that any advantage the offended team has as a result of the violation will remain an advantage with a quick restart. If a defensive team calls for a timeout and the officials inadvertently blow the whistle to stop play, a flag will be thrown and the 30-second technical foul penalty shall be assessed to the defensive team. This follows the same procedure as if a team calls a timeout but does not have any remaining. This is an example of a loose ball push by the team in yellow. And Timeout, the yellow out. team's coach immediately calls for a timeout, which is granted incorrectly. This will result in a technical foul against the team in yellow. Coach, you do not get a timeout. In home. 30 second foul. The intent of the rule is to allow for a quick restart for the white team in this case. As in past years, timeouts are allowed for both teams during all other dead ball situations. Examples of these are a shot leaving the field of play, a ball leaving the field of play on a sideline, injuries, after a goal is scored, after a time served foul, etc. At the end of all quarters and overtime periods, as well as at the end of all shot clock warnings, a goal will be counted if the release of the shot occurred prior to the expiration of the clock and or the horn sounding. This rule allows for continuation of play if the release of a shot, including bounce shots, occurs prior to the expiration of time. Officials are to hold their whistle at the end of all quarters and allow the play to finish after the sounding of the horn. In both of these examples, a shot is taken before the game clock expires. Short time, no whistle. Short clock, short clock. In both cases, the officials communicate verbally that the end of the period is approaching. In short both time, cases, no the shot was released before the expiration of time. Yes, the ball was released Goal before zero. Goal is yes, good. yes, yes. The officials communicate well before making any signal. A few significant items of importance for this rule. If the ball deflects off a defensive player and enters into the goal, the goal shall count. If the ball deflects off an offensive player and enters the goal, the goal shall not count. 
For a game-winning goal that occurs at the end of the fourth quarter or in overtime, a coach's request for a stick check would not be allowed. By rule, the game is considered to be complete in this situation. For a tying goal that occurs at the end of the fourth quarter, a coach's request for a stick check will be allowed. By rule, the game is not complete in this situation. The word grounded has been added to the language regarding play around the crease area. If an offensive player in possession of the ball and outside the crease area dives or jumps or becomes airborne of his own volition prior to, during, or after the release of the shot and lands in the crease, the goal shall be disallowed. On this play, the offensive player took the chance by diving or jumping. If he lands in the crease for any reason, the goal will not count. If an offensive player in possession of the ball and outside the crease area makes an inside move and keeps his feet or other parts of his body, his knees, etc., grounded and lands, steps in, or touches the crease after the ball enters the goal, the goal shall count. On this play, by staying grounded, the offensive player did not die or jump. This is a legal play. Ball's good. Ball's good. Both of these examples assume that the offensive player did not make contact with any part of the crease area or the goalie prior to the ball entering the goal. This is a good example of the offensive player with his feet on the ground before the goal is scored. This is a legal goal and running through the crease after the ball enters the goal is legal. Here the attacking player in blue does not leave his feet and launch himself. Good communication between the officials to get both perspectives before awarding the goal. This is a legal goal. In comparison to the previous clip, this crease play shows the attacking player clearly launching himself and landing in the crease. The officials use excellent mechanics and correctly disallow this goal. This is a very good quick restart and also shows that this restart can take place in the crease. This is an example of a foul by a defender. This play becomes dead when the attacking player steps on the crease line. Had he scored, the goal would have been disallowed. In this section, we've compiled three clips that are difficult plays around the crease. When watching these plays, keep these key elements in mind. Are the feet grounded? Did the attacking player launch himself? Was there a defensive foul? Did the ball enter the goal before the attacking player touches the crease? Was there contact with the goalkeeper? In all of these cases, these are extremely difficult calls to make. The added language is an effort to better define these plays and provide guidance for officials and players. Officials are instructed to focus as narrowly as possible on judging the facts of the play. For example, foul versus no foul, crease versus no crease. And not to speculate where a player might have ended up if he had not made contact with another player. The most important facts are, number one, contact was made, foul versus no foul. And number two, if the player was in the crease as a result of his decision to leave his feet. This is correctly ruled a disallowed goal. 
The attacking player in white is not fouled by the defense and leaves his feet after shooting the ball, causing him to land in the crease. Keeping the narrow focus concept, there was no defensive foul and the attacking player left his feet and landed in the crease, therefore no goal. The NCAA and men's lacrosse community would like to take this opportunity to thank Maryland Baltimore County head coach Don Zimmerman for his dedication to the sport. Coach Zimmerman recently completed his term as the sports secretary editor and his dedication and effort to improve the sport are greatly appreciated. Thank you for reviewing this video and good luck on a successful 2015 season.